So, hello everyone. Welcome to the TIFR TAM Colloquium. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Kevin Buzzard from the Imperial College, who will tell us about uh, teaching proofs to a computer. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much. So, uh, before we start, uh, thank you to Nishant for the invitation and uh, thank you to all of you for coming. And uh, the other thing I want to stress... Uh, interrupt, small interruption. So there are two people in the organizing committee, Ujwal, Kole and me. So uh, the invitation... Thank you to the entire organizing committee for the invitation. <laughs> uh, and uh, let, let me stress that I'm going to talk about computers and I, I suddenly have this terrifying... Uh, I, I'm suddenly slightly worried about something, but uh, let's let's press on and see if that happens. Uh, let, let me stress that um, I'm going to talk about computers, but I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, I am an algebraic number theorist, and uh, I entered this area five years ago, uh, and I had to learn uh, something about you know computer programs and computer theorem provers, uh, and I, I learned all this from scratch. So it's certainly possible. Uh, for mathematicians to pick this thing up. I had no uh, prior training in this sort of thing. Uh, so uh, let's get on. Yeah, so I, there's a, there's a problem. Uh, my slides are in, sorry, I'm gonna do something here. Just, <laughs> just give me uh, better. So uh, I'm going to talk about Lean, uh, which is a free uh, and open source uh, a computer proof assistant. So a computer proof assistant uh, is a computer program uh, that turns uh, mathematical proofs, uh, you know, the construction of a mathematical proof uh, into a computer game, or well, that's one way of thinking about it, into a computer puzzle game. Uh, so I'm going to show you Lean, but there's many other computer proof assistance which exist. I, I named some on the slides. Uh, and uh, I'm only using Lean because it's the, it's the one I know very well. Uh, but right now it does have, there's, there are quite a few mathematicians which are using this software quite seriously. So in terms of sort of mathematics being generated in computer theorem provers, uh, you know, Lean, Lean is one of the Lean is one of the proofs that's sort of moving forwards quite quickly. Uh, so these things have got lots of different names. Some people call them proof assistants. Some people call them theorem provers. Uh, some people call them interactive theorem provers because if you're an expert, you'll know that as well as interactive theorem provers, there's things called automatic theorem provers. Uh, and automatic theorem provers try and prove the theorem for you. Uh, whereas interactive theorem provers uh, you prove the theorem uh, by yourself and the computer checks it. So uh, let me stop talking about them and actually start showing you one of these things. So here is uh, uh, here is a computer theorem prover in action. So I, I started off with some boilerplate. So let me tell you what's happened here. The computer theorem prover itself um, knows the axioms of mathematics, uh, but it doesn't necessarily know any mathematics at all. Um, and then on top of the computer theorem prover, there are libraries of theorems. And um, I'm using Lean's maths library right now, uh, which is a 850,000 lines uh, of Lean code proving theorems in you know, topology analysis and algebra and number theory and, uh, and lots of other areas as well. Uh, and so I start uh, by importing some of the mathematics library and I import uh, you know, the basic theory of continuous functions. So after this import here, you see, if I, if, I, if I put two dashes in front of this import, then you see everything breaks. Lean instantly forgets what a topological space is. And if I put the import back, uh, then it remembers again. So after this import, Lean knows the basic theory uh, of to topological spaces and continuous functions. Uh, and so now I can, you know, now I can track, you know, this is a line uh, that we as mathematicians would write on a, on a board or in a paper, you know, let X, Y, and Z be topological spaces. Uh, and this is, this is the translation of that line uh, into the language of the theorem prover. 
so a topological space is a set with some extra structure on top, you know, a collection of open sets satisfying some axioms. Uh, but as it happens, Lean uses type theory, not set theory. So instead of letting X be a set, I let X be a type. Uh, but as, as far as we're concerned, types and sets, I mean, to a, to a mathematician, a type and a set are basically the same thing. Uh, I mean, there, there are sort of subtle differences, but we don't really need to worry about them here. Uh, so X, Y, and Z, uh, this makes them all topological spaces. Uh, and I've got functions from X to Y and from Y to Z. Uh, and the theorem I'm going to prove uh, is I'm going to prove that um, uh, if, the, if, these, if these functions are continuous, uh, then their composite is also continuous. So let's have the hypothesis HF that uh, says that F is continuous. Uh, and the hypothesis HG uh, says that G is continuous. Uh, and my conclusion uh, is that the composite G composed with F is continuous. Uh, and now I do this, there we go. And uh, this puts us into, uh, this puts us into sort of puzzle solving mode. And so what we have on the left is we have the, the lean code and um, I'm gonna be writing some lean code on the left. And if you haven't used lean before, or if you haven't used theorem provers before, um, the stuff that's actually happening on the left, I'm gonna be writing tactics, which, which uh, might be quite hard for a mathematician to follow. Uh, but on the right hand side, uh, we have the current state of Lean's brain. Um, and the right hand side is much easier to follow uh, because the, the right hand side is just a display of everything we know. So there's this weird little logic symbol here, this sideways T. Uh, and, ab and above that logic symbol is all the things that we know. So X, Y and Z are topological spaces, F and G are functions. And uh, these hypotheses that these functions are continuous. And on, and on the right of this weird sideways T um, is the thing we're trying to prove. So we're trying to prove that G composed with F is continuous. And uh, so imagine if we were teaching this to uh, undergraduates, we, I mean, what, what is the proof? Uh, what's the maths proof? Uh, let's just remind ourselves of the maths proof. Uh, I need to prove, uh, I need to prove that the pre-image of an open set is open, right? Uh, I need to prove that uh, if, if, U, if U in Z is open, uh, is open, then its pre-image uh, pre in uh, X is open, right? That, that's uh, because the definition of a continuous function is the pre-image of an open set is open. Uh, and so, and what's the proof? Uh, is that a question or just some noise? So, Sorry, is, this, is that a question? Okay, I'll press on. I think someone was just unmuted. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on? So, so what's the proof of this? Of course, the pre-image, uh, yeah, continuity of G. Uh, continuity of G says that the pre-image, uh, you know, let's call it V. Of, uh, of U in Y is open, uh, and now continuity of F, and now done by continuity of F. You know. uh, so there's, you know, there's there's a a sketch of the mathematics proof we'd write on the board if we were lecturing this to undergraduates. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is I'm just, you know, that's a sketch written in you know a human language, and now I'm just going to translate that sketch into a computer language. Uh, and we can sort of watch it unfold. Uh, uh, we can watch it unfold in real time. So the first thing we need to do is we need to get uh, from the assumption that something is continuous uh, to its definition, you know, the, the statement that the pre-image of an open set is open. Uh, so let's, uh, let's rewrite continuous def. Let's replace, uh, the, let's replace, so there we go. You see the brain change, right? The thing on the right change. We can, we can uh, click around before that, before I wrote this tactic, uh, our hypotheses were that things were continuous. And then afterwards, you see, we, the, 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 these assertions say things like, you know, if something is open, then, then something else is open. Uh, and so now we want to prove, uh, so now let's let, let's let U be an open set, uh, intro is U, H, U. Uh, so now U is a subset, set Z means a subset of Z. This is, you know, again, you have to, 
learn the slight, slightly sort of sometimes weird terminology. So U is a set of elements of Z. So U is a subset of Z. And H U is the hypothesis that U is open. And we need to prove that the pre-image of U under this map G composed with F uh, is also open. Uh, and so let's let's define V. Uh, let's define V. Uh, v um, let's let V be the pre-image of uh, U. Uh, so now V is defined to be the pre-image of U. And now I claim that V is open. Have H V. Uh, I claim that uh, is open. Is open V. So there you go. So uh, and how are we going to prove? You see, now we've got two. Got now you see, Lean's keeping track of everything, right? So Lean remembers we're still trying to prove. Uh, that the pre-image of U in X is open. But now we also have to prove a second thing because I've just randomly claimed uh, that V is open. Uh, and we've got to prove that V is open. So why is V open? V is the pre-image of U under G. So this follows from continuity of G. And continuity of G is the hypothesis HG. So let's apply the hypothesis that G is continuous. And he says, yeah, okay, well then V being open, that would follow from the fact that U is open. So now Lean's asking us to prove that U is open, but that's, uh, that's one of the hypotheses already. So that's the exact HU, you see. So I'm, I'm using many tactics on the left here. So to understand what's happening on the left, uh, you, you have to learn a new language. You have to learn a programming language, you know, a programming language that somehow corresponds to you know, applications of basic mathematical facts. Uh, and now we're back down to one goal. So now V is the pre-image of U, uh, in Y, and we have a hypothesis that V is open, uh, and now we want to prove that this last thing is open. So uh, this is, you know, going on a bit. So let me just let me just try and finish the whole thing. This should be exact by continuity of F, uh, and the fact that V is open. That should do it. It didn't quite do it. Let's try that. There we go. Um, so that, I mean, it's a relatively simple mathematical proof, uh, and that's what it looks like. Uh, that's what it looks like uh, in a computer theorem prover if you write it from first principles. And you can see that, <clears throat> you know, Lean's brain has now changed, right? Because there we solved the goal, uh, we proved the theorem, uh, and then we get this exciting goals accomplished thing. So this is the buzz you get, you see, you'll, you, know, you write one of, the, sometimes you write a proof and it's 30 lines long and you're plowing through and everything is changing on the right. Uh, you know, it's, it's a puzzle, you're trying to manipulate things and, Eventually, you realize you can put it all together and, uh, and then the theorem is proved and, you know, then you get slightly excited and then you go on to the next puzzle. And then you realize that you've been playing this game for hours and it's three o'clock in the morning. So uh, that's what a computer theorem prover looks like. And that's what I show the undergraduates when I'm teaching them this stuff at Imperial College. Uh, but of course, you know, is this, you can, you can completely imagine, as a mathematician that knows something about computers, you can completely imagine that some sort of software like this might exist, right? That's, that's it's sort of not difficult. You know, we stepped through, every time we applied something, we somehow applied a fact, we applied an axiom, you know, we applied the definition of continuity or, you know, the definition of an open set or whatever. Uh, so it's sort of not at all surprising that such you know such a computer game could exist but if you actually want to use it to do serious mathematics you can see that there's a problem here right because we've just taken seven lines of code uh, to prove something which is fairly trivial uh, and if you're actually you know if you want to prove a non-trivial theorem uh, in topology uh, then you'd rather have this sort of thing happen more automatically and so this is now when you sort of begin to see the advantages of, um, so let me prove it again, uh, but let me prove it in a quicker way. Um, so mathematicians started using this software in sort of 2018, 2019, and they quickly realized uh, that they wanted things like this to happen kind of quickly, right? They, um, they don't want to be chasing around open sets. Uh, and so in collaboration with computer scientists, you know, they explained what they wanted and, um, and the computer scientists wrote a new tactic, which is sort of specific. These sort of basic tactics are in all the theorem provers. Um, but Lean has a specific tactic which deals 
uh, with questions about continuity and it's called the continuity tactic. So if I run the continuity tactic instead, uh, then you see that it finishes, it finishes the proof instantly, right? We don't have to, we don't have to plow through the first principles proof. Um, because, you know, someone behind the scenes has written a computer program that knows a whole bunch of facts about uh, continuous functions. Um, for, yeah, for example, it knows like a map into a product is continuous precisely when the maps into the factors are continuous, this sort of thing. Uh, and the continuity tactic attempts to apply those functions in a sensible order. And uh, unsurprisingly, for a simple problem like this, uh, it succeeds uh, it succeeds in proving this. So this is sort of a very useful, you know, when you're in the middle of something, you're in the middle of a much bigger thing. And uh, Lean just sort of says, well, yeah, you want to apply this fact, but of course this fact needs the fact that this function is continuous. And you're just well, you know, of course it's continuous as a polynomial or something. Um, so the continuity tactic might well uh, just, just solve this goal for you straight away. Uh, but then of course, I mean, one of the things that this continuity tactic knows uh, is that the, the fact that a composite of two continuous functions is continuous um, is actually a sufficiently basic fact uh, that it really should be explicitly stated in the in the library already. I mean, uh, we have you know eighty thousand theorems in our in our library, and it's growing every day. Um, and so, actually, in, instead of bothering a tactic like the continuity tactic, it would be an, another way of proving this theorem would be by looking through the library uh, and just trying to find, uh, just trying to find the, the theorem as it is sort of directly stated in the library. So we can run the library search tactic and that just plows through all the theorems. And there we go, it's found, uh, it's underlined in blue, which means we can click over here. Uh, and so there's another proof of this tactic. And this isn't a full proof. What this proof has said, what, what this proof says is, yes, we've proved that already. You know, when I imported a bunch of basic facts about continuous functions, unsurprisingly, uh, one of those basic facts was the fact that the composite of continuous functions was continuous. Uh, so there's another proof. And the advantage of this proof over the continuity tactic proof is that this proof, you know, that, that takes maybe tens of milliseconds, whereas this, you know, this, this happens in sort of under a millisecond. Uh, this happens instantly, and sometimes you know speed is important. Some tactics are very costly; uh, they might do a lot of work but take several seconds to do it. So it's kind of nice to minimise uh, time spent. And then I guess the final trick I could show you uh, is that you probably don't even. How would a computer scientist prove this? I guess they would use dot note. Let me see if I can. I think hg.compHf. There we go. So there's. Uh, Again, I'm using the function that's in the library, but I'm, I'm using it in a sort of a slightly compressed way. The, 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 the nice thing about this proof is that the proof, um, the, the proof is shorter than the statement, right? So this is an extremely, uh, an extremely compressed proof um, of, of the kind that a computer scientist would prefer. So it just sort of shows that it actually, you know, so that there's several ways that you can interact with this software. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can use it for teaching, uh, or if you just want to get things done, uh, then there are various shortcuts that you can use as well. So, you know, that's what topology looks like in a theorem proof. And, and you can see, yeah, I mean, that's what topology looks like in a theorem prover. Can I interrupt you? Yeah, of course you can, of course. Clarifications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what I understand uh, from uh, your proofs, or the way uh, you worked with me, it is not uh, proving a theorem for me. Uh, if I uh, write down a proof, then it will check. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, it can search for uh, theorems which are already in the system, but it yeah. will not try to, uh, will it also try to actually prove things uh, using the things that it knows? Well, the, the tactics I showed you are little algorithms which attempt to prove theorems you know, using a certain method. For example, the continuity tactic will have, in, you know, if you put that continuity tactic in the wild, then, then it will have a limited success in proving that various functions are continuous. 
And the reason that the success will be limited is that you know, proving that a function is continuous probably probably girdles theorem or some, you know, there, there will be some, you, you can't write a tactic that that proves an arbitrary theorem in mathematics sure. because because you know there there are you know it's a theorem that you can't do that. And uh, so any algorithm will have limitations. Uh, but you know the, the continuity tactic will attempt to prove that a function is continuous. Uh, and it may or may not succeed, uh, but we don't have, you know, and, and if it doesn't succeed, we could of course try another tactic. Uh, I mean, the continuity tactic was specifically designed to prove that functions were continuous. So this is essentially the only tactic, the only sensible tactic that one could try. But if you're trying to prove another theorem, uh, there's many other tactics and each, each of these tactics apply an algorithm, right? And if the algorithm succeeds, then you've proved the theorem automatically. But of course, you know, if you're in the wild doing, a more complicated piece of mathematics. You know, mathematics is not done algorithmically, right? You know, sometimes it is. Sometimes we look at something and say, "Oh, that just you just you know just chase the diagram round." You know, this will follow by some diagram chase, and you know, then we have some diagram chase tactic. Uh, but you know, some things are just hard, and then basically what happens is you have to give the computer clues. You know, you, you that you beyond beyond some point. You have to start typing in some kind of high level version of the proof yourself. You say, next we prove this, next we prove this, now it all fits together. And you know, you go, you, you make you make small steps with the tactics, uh, but the high level proof, you know, wow. you're, you're you're typing it in yourself. And and this is the difference. An, an, aut an automatic theorem prover, you type in the theorem and then you go away and you come back in two days and you right. sort of the whole thing by itself. Uh, so this is lean is an interactive theorem prover. So right now, that's you know this is state of the art. Uh, this this is this is what these interactive theorem provers look like in twenty twenty two. There's a question by yeah yeah sure sure sure. I mean if you don't mind me overrunning, I will happily take as many questions as you like. I, I'm in yeah. no hurry. We don't mind. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. since you mentioned uh, automatic theorem provers, but since you're focusing on lean, let's stay with lean. Uh, let's assume, uh, just for fun, I decide to use lean as though it were an automatic theorem prover, which is while I open up uh, a, a puzzle solving mode, uh, I, I just refrain from giving any hints. Uh -huh. uh, and I just sit back and watch what happens and suppose, uh, and, and I use it in the, the most efficient mode that you demonstrated. Uh, and the theorem actually, uh, the lean actually informs me that a certain goal has been accomplished. Oh, great. Then yeah. can I actually get into the various libraries and the compilation of tactics to then be able to write down the proof in a form that I can read? In other words, crudely put, can I then look into lean's brain? Yeah, this is a great question. And the answer is sometimes. Uh, so let me let me show you a great example of, um, of, of when this is sort of catastrophically wrong. Uh, so let's here's prove it. Here's proof, here's an easy theorem. I claim that if A and B are integers, uh, then A plus B squared is A squared plus two AB plus B squared, right? Uh, so let's see if we can try and prove this easy theorem. And now, of course, the human says, oh, just multiply everything out and tidy up and we're done, right? And unsurprisingly, we have a tactic for that. So it's called ring. So let's use the ring tactic. Oh, it didn't work. Uh, I need to import it. Uh, import, let's import tactic.ring. Uh, yeah, because this was about topology. So we didn't need, so there we go. I've imported the ring tactic and then we get goals accomplished. So the computer has done something and we can guess what it's probably done. It's you know, expanded out the brackets, it's sorted out all the terms and it's realized it can do it. So now let's actually have a look at the computer proof. And here it is, so it's completely incomprehensible. So, the, and the reason I gave you this example is because I know the ring tactic is a great example of a tactic uh, that that produces proofs which are incomprehensible to humans. Uh, whereas on the other hand, the continuity tactic, uh, we can have a look at what the continuity tactic did. Uh, so let's, whatever, uh, 
theorem uh, theorem also easy. Uh, I suspect that the continuity tactic. Uh, uh, let's uh, print also easy. Uh, I'm rather hoping that this will be shorter. Yeah, you see that th this one here. We can look at what the proof. The, the proof is this very last line here. Ah, yes. yeah. And so this proof is very short and I can tell you what it says. It says it says this follows from the fact that the, the composition of continuous functions is continuous. And uh, so so this fact, I mean, I have some lean training so I can read this one. So he says I'm using the theorem in the library that says the composition of continuous functions is continuous. And you can and you can jump to that. You can see the proof in the library. Uh, right. And this is the proof in the library that the composite of continuous functions is continuous. And you, you, it's sort of difficult to understand that as well if you don't know, if you don't know any lean. But you know, for me, this is not too difficult to read. You know, this is use the definition of continuity, and then you know, let S be an open set, let H be the hypothesis that it's open, and then its preimage is open. This is the proof that the preimage of an open is open, and this is the proof that the preimage of an open is open. So sometimes you can read them. But if you ask a tactic to generate a complicated proof, you, this might look simple to you, but the proof of this is really complicated. Because if you actually expand out the brackets, uh, then when you finished all that, you have to apply associativity and commutativity of addition, you know, and you have to apply the fact that two equals one plus one, and that one plus one distributes over multiplication. There's all kinds of things going on that we don't even notice. And, uh, and all the details of those things are here, and it makes the whole thing a nightmare. So, yeah, the, the full proof of such a theorem from first principles is actually much longer than you might think. Uh, and so when you look at what it looks like in a theorem prover, you can be quite horrified. So, yeah, the answer to your question is sometimes. Sometimes you can see what it did, but sometimes it really is a black box. You know, and okay, so it's literally a black box. So my follow up question was going to be, uh, I saw certain proper nouns which uh, were clearly incomprehensible to me, but Presumably, if someone knew in principle the structure of the entire uh, lean library, uh, these things that look like proper nouns are in fact each of these individual black boxes, right? I, I mean, beyond some point, then, beyond, I don't, I, I sorry, I don't think I really understood the question. Beyond some point, they're not black boxes. Beyond some point, they're axioms of mathematics. Yeah, no, what I meant was. Uh, uh, I saw a bunch of proper nouns. You saw so a bunch of what? Sorry, proper nouns. Okay, you know, I, tactic, ring, horner, etc. Yeah, yeah, et yeah. Oh, the, yeah, 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 yeah. These so, are in all... principle, if someone knew their way around uh, the Lean library extremely well, yeah, what yeah, yeah. looks what looks like a black box, they would be able to zero into yeah, absolutely. each item in the well, library. Yeah, you right? could, so you it could, would merely you could be laborious. This, but no it human would, would want to read this. Right. It's, like, so it would be merely laborious, but in but, principle, uh, one can open up each of the boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in practice, you want to get a computer to read that, right? <laughs> yes. these, these, these kinds of outputs here. I mean, some people ask the question, how do you know the computer's got it right? And the answer to that question is, you can take this complicated computer output and turn it into some kind of directed acyclic graph and feed it into a type checker that checks that this really is a proof of this statement from the axioms of mathematics. But as a human, you don't really want to look at the proofs that these things are generating. Uh, this, yeah. this is much harder than you think, right? This, as I say, it, I was quite astonished when I started trying to prove these sorts of things from first principles. Uh, it's it, the, the proof of this is long because it, as mathematicians, we just skip things. We don't put the brackets in. You know, we, you don't notice we're using associativity. Uh, there's all sorts of things missing. Anyway, I'll, let's get back to the talk or I'll never finish. Uh, so historically, of course, we've all used computers uh, and we all know that, you know, they can compute. They, you know, they can compute the first 1000 prime numbers, that sort of thing. Uh, but what, I, what I'm showing you now is in some sense, a different use of computers. Uh, we, we, I'm showing you that they can be used to reason, to prove theorems. You know, you could, you could use your favorite computer algebra package uh, to work out the first 1000 prime numbers or add them up or whatever you want to do with them. Uh, but you can't use a computer algebra package to prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers. 
uh, you know, you could you could just get it to print out more and more and observe that it doesn't seem to be stopping. Uh, but using lean, you can prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So it's a, it's different to a computer algebra package. You know, it's it's not doing calculations; it's doing theorems. Uh, and as I say, and it does these and it does these theorems in a in a rather interesting way. I think it, you know it turns the proof of a theorem uh, into a computer puzzle game, uh, which, as I say, can be quite addictive. Uh, so. I became addicted in about 2017, and uh, the, the, ha, the way I learned how to use uh, this theorem prover uh, was because I was teaching an introduction to proof course at Imperial College, and, um, and I thought I would try solving my own problem sheets, uh, because that sort of seemed like the right level for me, you know, I knew the mathematics inside out, uh, but it, 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 these seem to me like good questions for a computer proof assistant, because, you know, in my mind, my introduction to proof course is somehow, you know, the, the beginning of university level mathematics. At school level mathematics, there's a lot of calculations and there's not so many proofs, but, you know, proof assistants are you know, specifically focused not on doing, cal they can do calculations, but they're focused on doing proofs. Uh, so I tried formalizing these proofs and it actually was quite a lot of hard work. I, it was much harder than I expected. Um, but, you know, you know, it being 2017, we have an internet uh, and we have chat rooms and there's a lean chat room. And I asked hundreds of questions on the lean chat room and, you know, young PhD students and MSc students, typically in computer science, uh, would answer my questions and I thought this is you know quite exciting really because I'm a professor in algebraic number theory but you know I'm being taught you know it's kind of the other way around to usual I'm being taught how to how to do something by P I've been taught how to do mathematics in a new way uh, by PhD students uh, and so now of course the tables have turned now I can use the software and so now I do teach it to the undergraduates but what I find very interesting uh, is that actually some of these undergraduates get better than me. Uh, and again, that's something else that would not happen if I'm teaching a basic number theory class, then at the end of it, I still know something about the Langlands philosophy. And these kids have just learned, you know, the basics of, you know, how to solve some basic Diophantine equations. I'm still way ahead. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to teach a course to people that by the end of it, you know, sometimes telling me techniques. Uh, you know, again, it's it's a it's a. I find the whole thing a very humbling experience. So it's, it's sort of I find it quite exciting. Uh, so okay, I've I've shown you how this thing can do. You know, prove a trivial result in topology. I've shown you you know three or four proofs of this thing, and I've also shown you how it can prove a trivial lemma you know, in in uh, ring theory, if you like. Uh, but now, of course, you have to ask. Yeah, you know, is it sort of where's the limit, right? Yeah, you know, is it just is it just a kind of system where we can do some undergraduate level mathematics? And you know, one of the reasons I'm probably been invited to give this talk is the, the point is it's uh, uh, it's it's not a toy at all. Um, and you know, we've uh, recently the community has proved uh, a theorem of Clausen and Schultz that they announced in 2020. Uh, and in fact, they challenged us to prove an even harder theorem. And if you give us a few more weeks, I think we're going to have proved uh, that the reals are a liquid vector space. This is somehow one of the one of the research projects I'm working on right now. So, you know, one thing that's happened since 2017 is that these things have um, started to engage with modern research level material, and the you know the discovery that we've made in some sense. Uh, was that this this stuff does actually scale? This is somehow the exciting thing. Uh, you know, it's it's very easy to make a a simple toy that knows. You can imagine for a computer scientist, it would be relatively straightforward to make a relatively simple toy that knows some axioms, and then can you can apply the axioms to prove some lemmas. Um, but but this is a lot more than a toy. This is turns out to be an extremely powerful system. It was, I mean, it was written by a genius. Uh, Leo de Mara. So, uh, so there we are. Uh, so there's several things I want to talk about today. And one of the things is, you know, what's the point, right? We, I mean, 
Clausen and Schultz approved their theorem, you know, pen and paper, and then they transferred their proof over to PDF using LaTeX, uh, and they put their proof up on the internet. Uh, and that's, you know, the quotes old fashioned way of doing things, if you want to regard the internet as old fashioned. Uh, and, you know, I'm suggesting that there's a new way that we can do things, which is via interactive theorem proofers. Uh, but, you know, what's wrong with the old way? What's the what's the wide change? We've got a we've got a perfectly good system. Uh, why do maths? Why do maths in the new way? And of course, you know, you could ask why do maths at all, right? That's another it's a perfectly valid question in some sense. But um, you know, if you're if you're going to do maths at all, then uh, you can choose you can choose how to do it. You can choose the PDF route, or you can choose the interactive theorem prover route. And right now, the interactive theorem prover route has many disadvantages. You know, it's slower. Uh, it takes more work. Uh, however, it also has many advantages. You know, in my mind. The main one of which is that it's impossible to make a mistake, uh, which, which for me is, you know, I, I, that's quite an important point, I think. Uh, but there are other answers to this question. You know, why do mathematics in a theorem prover rather than in the old way? You see, the, the problem is computers cannot read human mathematical papers. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a question that, that's a question that, you know, people are actively working on trying to train computers to read LaTeX or trying to train computers to read mathematical textbooks. But you know, the, the problem is you, got, it's not just, you can scan it, you can figure out what the words are, right? Or you could even turn PDF into LaTeX. That somehow seems completely feasible. But the, the question is, how do you get computers to have some kind of you know, semantic understanding of what's actually happening? And you know, can they actually follow the logical arguments rather than just you know, figure out how to typeset them? Uh, so that, that turns out to be an extremely difficult problem uh, that, that I know very little about, but my understanding is that it's not been solved yet and there are no, there are no sort of breakthroughs on the horizon as far as I know. Uh, so teaching computers to read um, human mathematical texts is hard. Uh, this is an alternative approach uh, where instead of writing the human texts, we write the computer texts instead. Uh, so we are digitizing mathematical proofs and you can look at other things that we've digitized. You know, we digitized chess and we digitized Go. We taught the rules of these things to computers and then we showed them some chess games and some Go games. And then, if, of course, unsurprisingly, after a point, uh, computers get better than us. So this is the question. Uh, you know, I've shown you some basic tactics that prove some basic things. And then there's this theoretical limitation by Girdle, there'll be no one amazing tactic that can prove every true thing. Uh, but what about more powerful tactics that can prove more stuff? Uh, more, you know, more than just the basics, more than just composite of continuous functions as continuous. And these big companies, uh, you know, with a lot of with a lot of money and, and an interest in you know, pushing forward this area, uh, are trying to train AIs uh, to, to start generating. Uh, code, you know, math code like lean code by themselves. You know, some people try and make tactics, and other people you know, try and guess the guess the next tactic you want to apply, and they want to write a multi-tactic proof. Uh, you know, there's sort of lots of different ideas going into these things. Uh, you know, we have we have AIs that can write newspaper articles that look like they you know they read like they've been written by humans, and the idea is if you know if we have 850,000 lines of proofs and then we could train a computer to write proofs like it sees uh, in this big database and so you have to start you know you could then naively ask the question uh, does this mean that in 10 years time the AIs would have taken over and uh, they will be generating you know billion line long incomprehensible proofs of the Riemann hypothesis that no human can understand because we can't understand the proof that x plus y squared is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. So if a computer comes along with an auto-generated proof of the Riemann hypothesis, uh, then it says that this is definitely right. We can check it follows from the axioms of mathematics. It will give you no you know, understanding as to why the theorem is true. Uh, but you do kind of begin to say, you know, is some model uh, might be that we're all going to be out of business and uh, 
I don't know. So my guess is that this is absolutely nonsense. My guess, uh, my guess is that this is complete science fiction. So the computer scientists talk about it like this, uh, but my guess is that that we as mathematicians understand how profoundly difficult and deep mathematics is, and you know if we can't do it as humans, the thought that some incredibly fast machine that has even less insight. You know, does the speed that computers can go make up for the fact that in some sense they have a lot less insight? You know, they're, they're not working intuitively, they're doing something else. Uh, so my guess is that you know, we're, they're not gonna be proving the Riemann hypothesis anytime soon. Uh, so you know, if, if, if that's not the point, then what is the point? Uh, and my, my belief is that if more mathematicians start getting involved in this, uh, in this area and more mathematicians learn the language of one of these theorem provers, you know, it doesn't have to be lean, you could learn any other theorem prover, but, uh, you know, I personally learn lean and, uh, you know, you, I, I think, you know, it, it would be th in theory possible to build gigantic mathematics libraries and all of these things. And once we have gigantic mathematics libraries, we can start imagining making digital assistants uh, where we're you know, grinding out things and we, we have to check that some diagram commutes and we think it should be fine and we give it to the computer and the computer grinds away and comes up with an incomprehensible proof that the diagram commutes and it just tells us that it's okay. And so we just assume it, we say, you know, it can be easily checked that the diagram commutes, remark, Lean did it for us. Uh, and then we can just, you know, we, we will become more efficient as mathematicians. I think that this is not science fiction. Uh, I think this is a genuine possibility. And, uh, you know, let's see who's right. Uh, but right now, they're certainly not helping us. In fact, this sort of famous quote of Hendrik Lenstro is that, you know, there's, he doesn't use proof assistance because they don't assist us right now. They, they're, there's, right now, sometimes you feel that they're, they're proof impeders. They're just slowing us down. And uh, there are things which are trivial on paper, uh, but somehow you know, turn out to be very slow to do in a proof assistant. So that's why what, one of the reasons I'm interested in, you know, developing this software and, you know, trying to push it to do mathematics is because I think that math mathematicians and computer science collaborating uh, mathematicians and computer scientists collaborating are going to start to be able to make tools for us. But, you know, right now I'm just sort of concentrating on making the mathematics library. The AI people can worry about turning it into a tool that can help us. Uh, you know, the way I can contribute uh, is by growing the mathematics library. So let me tell you where we are with the mathematics library. So Lean by itself uh, just really knows you know, the basic rules of mathematics, basic logic. Uh, it, it, you know, it happens to use type theory, which is sort of different to set theory, but it, it, it proves the same theorems as set theory, right? Set theory just has sets and the elements of sets are sets. Type theory works a bit differently. You know, type is the analog of set, but you know, the elements of types are called terms and a term is not a type. Uh, so you, know, you have G, capital G as a group, uh, and that has elements and little x is an element of the group. And in set theory, x, strictly speaking, also has elements, uh, but we don't care what they are. And in type theory, x doesn't actually have elements. X is just an, you know, an atom, a term. So in some sense, that's one of the differences between type theory and set theory as a foundation. Uh, and so as you can see, you know, this is the definition of a, a group in lean. So instead of saying it's a set equipped with a multiplication of blah, 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 we say it's a type equipped with a multiplication and blah, blah, blah. And set theory and type theory, they prove the same theorems, they're equiconsistent. Uh, so it's, it's not really a switch, it's just you know, a, a change of language. But of course, as you can imagine, beyond some point when you're doing mathematics, you're not really thinking about set theory and the axioms of set theory. And it's just the same in lean. Beyond some point, you're not really thinking about type theory and the axioms of type theory. So that's the part that Core Lean does, the part written by Microsoft. It's, it's free and open source software. So it's out there on GitHub. Uh, and then on top of that, we want to teach this thing mathematics. Uh, so we're developing a gigantic mathematics library, which is much bigger than the Core Lean itself. You know, Core Lean is a, 
is a is a computer program that's sort of a, you know, a relatively stable thing. Whereas the mathematics library is just growing, you know, it grows, it gets, you know, 10, 10 more theorems every day. It grows very rapidly, it gets more than 10 more theorems every day. It gets 10 new pull requests every day, some of which contain, you know, 50 theorems. Uh, and this mathematics library is called Mathlib. Uh, and it started, so it started coincidentally uh, the time I entered the area, but it was, you know, I was very much pushing for the fact that, you know, it's it, what was missing, you know, a big thing that I felt was missing from the, the theorem prover community was just a big robust implementation of all of undergraduate mathematics. Uh, and this is, you know, this is, it's, it's not my library, it's developed by a huge team a huge team of volunteers, uh, but I certainly think it's a very good idea, right? This, this, this is not a project led by me. Let me absolutely stress that, uh, especially if this is going up on YouTube. Uh, this, is a, this is a community project. It's an open source community project. Uh, anyone can join in. And uh, you know, one of the ways I fit in with the project uh, is that I think it's a terrifically good idea. <laughs> and another way is that, you know, I occasionally make lemmas in algebra and number theorem. Uh, so let me show you an overview of the library. If I click on this, I should go to, here we are. Here's a, uh, here's, we have a, you know, we have some nice web pages and you can sort, you can sort of see what's in here. You know, we have algebra, there's a bunch of category theory. There's a bunch of sort of undergraduate level group theory, you know, Sulof's theorems, Nilpotent groups, permutation groups. There's ring theory. You know, there's there's a, a whole bunch of the stuff you see in an undergraduate degree, you know, basic facts about polynomials and power series. Uh, there's field theory, there's Galois theory, there's homological algebra is, is, is slowly being developed. We have X, we have X and Tor now in homological algebra. So we can start proving things uh, about modules. We have things like flat modules and projective modules. Uh, you know, it, it just goes up. We have, it's, un, you know, what we have is unsurprising. In fact, to me, what is surprising is that in 2017, when I entered the area, that such a library didn't already exist because the tools have existed for decades. Uh, but somehow the idea of making a robust library containing all of undergraduate mathematics, as opposed to just the parts which are easy to do in theorem provers, uh, this somehow seems to be the new innovation, which is somehow changing, which is you know changing the game. Here we go piles of analysis. Uh, we have LP spaces, things like this. You know, we have Haar measure, Lebesgue measure, some very fancy integrals. Um, you know, it, it, it just goes on and on. So there is, uh, there is the current state of our undergraduate mathematics library. Uh, it's still not complete. Uh, the, you know, the, the project is not develop an undergraduate degree and then stop. The project is, you know, develop develop a robust foundation for modern mathematics, like Borbaki. So for example, uh, we don't have much, we currently group representation theory, representation theory of finite groups is being actively developed, but it's not there yet. Uh, we don't have a nice theory of compact Riemann surfaces. Um, we have the definition of a real manifold, but you know, we're, we're slowly working on uh, applications. We have vector bundles now. Uh, but, but on the other hand, we have a lot of stuff which is well beyond undergraduate. We, we, algebra, algebra is probably the furthest ahead. We have a bunch of MSc level algebra. Uh, we have a lot of the algebra done in Borbaki and we have a lot of the topology done in Borbaki as well. Uh, a lot of topological algebra too, uh, you know, valuations and completions. Uh, and, and we have a, a lot of category theory because category theory is used to is being used to power the homological algebra, and it's also being used to power you know scheme theory. We've, we're developing basic facts about the category of schemes, uh, and you know so some areas develop more quickly than others, and which areas are going faster simply depends on you know who is who is in the community at the time and who is working on these problems. Uh, and every month, uh, the community publishes a blog post uh, which summarizes, you know, the new things that have happened this month. One of the one of the most exciting things that happened today uh, is, well, I, I let me let me backtrack on that. Let's let's wait until it's happened. Uh, but you know, th things are happening all the time. Every month, a few interesting new things happen. 
So there we go, we're making a gigantic mathematics library. It's currently eight, you know, 850,000 lines long. If you give us another few months, we're gonna hit a million. That would be kind of a, an interesting milestone. Uh, you know, one of the great things is that we're, we're showing that, you know, things do scale. It's possible for Lean to handle a 1 million line long mathematics library. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun making it. This is one of the reasons I'm, you know, one of the reasons I like to make it. And I show undergraduates how to contribute and I show PhD students how to contribute and they help making it as well. And yeah, I was talking to a PhD student yesterday who, who freely confessed that you know, he'd become just as addicted as I had. So it's, you know, it's a new Borbaki. That's one way of thinking about it. It's 21st century Borbaki. In fact, the development of the material we often take pretty much exactly the same route uh, that Borbaki take. You know, we developed a huge theory of integration, taking values in certain topological vector spaces before we proved, uh, before we proved you know, the fundamental theorem of calculus in one variable. Uh, and, you know, the, the same as Borbaki. Uh, uh, you, you don't develop it in the order that you teach it. Uh, you develop it uh, you know, with different things in mind. You develop you develop very general machines, and then you apply those machines uh, to do you know special cases. And we had some very very general form of Stokes's theorem, and uh, and got things like the fundamental theorem of calculus out of that. Um, another advantage of making a massive formalized mathematics library is that if people want to go ahead and just do some completely different, a much harder project, you know, for example, proving a theorem of of Clausen and Schultz. Uh, um, then they can use the mathematics library and build on top of it. You know, they can make another project which imports the mathematics library and builds on top. Um, so one of the first examples of this, you know, one of, one of the first proofs of concepts uh, was that in 2019, when our library was much smaller, but still you know, it had become highly non-trivial. We had a lot of things, you know, homology, we had a lot of you know, basic linear algebra and uh, ring theory. And uh, a team of lean users, uh, Xander Darwin, Johannes Hilzel, and Rob Lewis, uh, they formalized the 2017 Annals of Mathematics paper, just to kind of make it clear that sort of modern research mathematics, it was possible to formalize it uh, in real time. Uh, this, this paper was specifically chosen uh, because it was a relatively short and sort of ingenious argument um, but it was really, you know, it was linear algebra over finite fields to a large extent and sort of combinatorics and uh, counting arguments. So the argument was brilliant, but on the other hand, the proof was relatively short and it only used theorems which were already uh, in the mathematics library at the time, 2019. But this was an interesting milestone uh, to, to formalize a recent Annals of Mathematics paper. Uh, but as I say, at the time we were slightly limited in what we could do because we didn't have sort of you know, more complicated you know, uh, mathematical, you know, we didn't have any algebraic geometry. We wouldn't have been able to formalize, you know, we were a long way from formalizing the 2017 algebraic geometry annals of mathematics paper, uh, you know, because we didn't have the definition of the category of schemes. I think, we, or maybe we'd only just got it, I think. Uh, so talking of schemes, uh, uh, one of the first projects after I'd finished formalizing my undergraduate course notes, uh, I, I formalized the definition of a scheme with, um, with several undergraduates um, at my university. We proved some very basic theorems about schemes. It was at this point that I realized that the software wasn't a toy. You know, it was a, this was a relatively straightforward project, just making a scheme and proving basic theorems about schemes. But it worked sort of seamless. It worked flawlessly. You know, we just... We typed in the mathematics, we learned how to speak the language, we typed in the mathematics, and it all happened. And we, and we built the definition on top of Lean's maths library. And we used the maths library, built on top of it, and then later on, uh, we started moving you know, our own development. We started making pull requests and making our development part of the mathematics library. So it was developed as an individual project, and then later on, it was somehow swallowed up by the mathematics library. And uh, this is how the mathematics library grows. You know, people, people do other things and, and then they make it slightly better. Hello, Moto. Uh, sorry. Uh, and I wrote this up as a 
I wrote this up as a paper, which was quite nice. Uh, a publication of this with um, some co-authors. My phone is constantly ringing, so I'm going to switch it off. Um, so all of all of my co-authors are now writing PhDs. Uh, so then what happened was we did perfectoid spaces after we did schemes and it became clear that uh, that uh, that you know the schemes were easy as it were. Uh, we started on perfectoid spaces because um, we thought that this was a you know a much more non-trivial challenge and also it was a challenge that we thought the mathematical community might be more interested in. You know, I went around telling people we'd formalized schemes and the typical response I had was, well, you know, we teach schemes to the MSc students. Um, so we formalized perfectoid spaces, which Schultzer had just run a Fields Medal for. Uh, and, and, you know, then it was quite, by this stage, it was quite clear that, you know, if the software could do this, the software could do anything. Uh, and we didn't develop a big theory of perfectoid spaces. Uh, we made a trivial example of a perfectoid space. You know, we, we proved that the empty set was a perfectoid space. And we didn't prove any profound theorems about perfectoid spaces. We were well aware that this would take you know, a whole lot more work. Um, but one of the main reasons we did it uh, was as a, an attempt to show the mathematics community the kind of things that were now possible. Uh, you know, someone's just got a Fields Medal for making perfectoid spaces. Well, do you know what? We can make perfectoid spaces too, uh, and you know. So, in theory, it means that computers can engage with modern research mathematics, and 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 this has been true for for quite some time. It certainly didn't become magically true in 2019, and it wasn't true in 2017. Uh, the thing that was changing was that there were now mathematicians in the computer theory improving community that were interested, you know, in, in in Fields Medal winning mathematics, and uh, we're taking the time to demonstrate that it could be done. You know, in theory, this kind of stuff could have been done, could have been done decades ago, I think. Uh, but uh, but uh, but also, you know, it was it was it was, an, it was I, I've said this several times before. It was an attempt to to show people that these theorem provers couldn't just prove theorems about finite fields or finite groups or planar graphs or whatever. Um, you could prove hard theorems. Uh, well, you know, you could you could do something completely different to proving hard theorems about elementary objects. You could prove elementary theorems about incredibly complicated objects. Uh, and, and one of the one of the crucial observations is that if you want to prove theorems about perfectoid spaces in a theorem prover, then you've got to have people on your team that know what a perfectoid space is. Uh, and you know, this is somehow what we're doing in Lean that. Uh, that maybe other theorem provers don't do. They have they have computer scientists involved or people interested in type theory or constructive mathematics. But uh, you know, trying to actually encapsulate what's happening in a mathematics department in 2022, you need more than that. You know, you need you know you need research level geometry, topology, algebra, analysis, this sort of thing. Uh, so we made perfectoid spaces and a, a bunch of young people then showed up on the lean chat, you know, interested, uh, interested by the project uh, and started developing other things. You know, they started helping out, you know, ba making basic undergraduate and MSc level mathematics and looking for interesting projects. And then in 2020, uh, Peter Schultzer, who was aware of the perfectoid spaces work, he challenged us um, to prove uh, a recent theorem of his, you know, he just thought that would be an interesting, you know, uh, just a, just a you know, another data point. You know, great, great. We can prove complicated theorems about simple objects. We can prove simple theorems about complicated objects. But can we prove a complicated theorem about a complicated object? In some sense, it's the last missing piece of the puzzle. So in December 2020, we were challenged. I mean, the whole formalization community was challenged by Peter Schultzer. Uh, to prove a recent theorem, the theorem that the reals are a liquid vector space. And uh, if this, if we hadn't had this big influx of arithmetic geometers in 2019, uh, the answer would have been, we just don't have the, we don't have the person power to do it. You know, we just need more people. Uh, but by 2019, there was enough people, by 2020, uh, there was enough people to actually make this project feasible. Uh, so one of the reasons we did it was that Schultzer was extremely enthusiastic um, about, about the theorem. 
you know, this is someone who'd already won a Fields Medal for something else, but he claimed in public, you know, he wrote this in public on my blog. He said, I think this may be my most important theorem to date, which is really quite a surprising thing to say, quite a surprising thing to say. But he says this is a very important theorem. You know, it was about condensed abelian groups. It was about sort of complicated mathematical objects uh, and about extension groups in this category. Uh, but, you know, he was just like, you know, he, he had checked it, Clausen had checked it, but he thought it would be interesting to see if a computer could check it. Uh, and he remarked that he'd asked many people, many humans, whether they'd looked at the proof and they all said yes. And then he said, had they looked very carefully at all the details and followed all the details? And people were saying no. So he really felt that this was a particular example of a theorem where one really needed to check all of the details. And he thought that you know, a computer theorem prover would be perfect for this. Uh, and then this was his motivation. The idea is that you, you want to start applying techniques from homological algebra uh, to areas where they have not been traditionally used, you know, functional analysis, this sort of thing, uh, you know, sort of differential geometry. Uh, so that was what we were faced with, you know, could we prove that a certain higher X, X group vanished in some category of condensed abelian groups? And the strategy of the proof is firstly, you reduce this complicated theorem about high level objects. Uh, you reduce it to a much longer, very technical lemma about much easier objects, you know, abelian groups equipped with some sort of filtration, having some properties. Uh, and so you reduce the theorem about high level objects to a technical result about low level objects. Uh, and then you prove the result about low level objects using a very delicate induction argument. Uh, so when this was when this was set as a challenge, there was no definition of homo, you know, there were no abelian categories in Lee. It was impossible to even talk about the X group. Uh, so there was no way that we could even state uh, the challenge problem. But the technical lemma was absolutely in, in, in scope. So two months after the challenge had been made, you know, we'd made a theory of filtrations on abelian groups. We'd made some theory of uh, you know, complexes of abelian groups. And we formally stated the lemma and the, the, the project was that again, this is not my, you know, I, I'm talking about these things. And I think I, I've noticed that people come away from my talks, believing that I'm the big person behind it and that everything is being run by me. This is, couldn't be furthest from the case. Uh, so this project to formalize this theorem of Schultz and Glass, and I've contributed, you know, I'm, I'm certainly one of the, you know, probably one of the top five contributors, but the project is being led by Johan Komelin, who's by far, you know, the, uh, the, the main contributor, and uh, he's a postdoc in Freiburg. So two months after we'd stated it, uh, we'd managed to prove it. Uh, in my mind, this was not particularly surprising because the proof was sort of very fiddly, but in some sense, it was mostly elementary. There were some, there were some statements about finitely generated monoids, which were slightly subtle. We had to develop a, a small amount of, you know, the theory of, I guess you could call it, um, toric varieties or the, the lemmas that go into the theory of toric varieties and basic results about commutative monoids. Uh, but four months later, we proved the lemma. And then we felt that, you know, the big struggle was now to come. We now had to deduce the theorem. Uh, and so it, you know, it took another six months to formally state the theorem because we built enough homological algebra. We have a theory of abelian categories. Uh, we have extension groups. Uh, we have condensed abelian groups. We have, pro, you know, we have profinite spaces. We've stated the theorem, and uh, it, it's not going to be long. You know, you can see that every few months there's more progress. Uh, give us a few more months, maybe even a few more weeks, uh, and we're going to have proved this theorem. I, I believe. I don't see anything. I don't see anything in the way of us proving the theorem. You know, the software isn't slowing down. The lemmas are being knocked off. Uh, so while we have not finished the project. To my slight surprise, uh, when we announced the proof of the lemma, uh, it turned out that this was precisely the part uh, of the argument that Schultz was worried about. This, is, this was the part that Schultz was worried that humans were not reading carefully because the proof is very, very, it, it's not deep, but it's just extremely sort of messy. You have to prove a theorem of the form for all A, there exists a B, such that for all C, there exists a D, such that for all E, there exists an F, such that G, and, and you prove this using induction and you have to keep a real careful track 
of exactly what you've proved and what you haven't proved and you know what you can assume and uh, exactly at what point in the argument you can assume it uh, and, and you know, the argument is sort of long but it's it's low level but very long and extremely messy I think that's the best way to describe it you know it's it's, it's a messy argument and it's a you know it says something about Schultz that he's managed to or Clausen and Schultz that they've managed to see their way through this technical argument but for Schultz deducing the theorem from this technical lemma was 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 easy it wasn't the thing he was worried about he was worried about uh, the technical lemma so he was very excited uh, when we announced that we had a complete proof of the technical lemma and uh, I mean you can read he, he wrote a he wrote a blog post if you google for a liquid tensor experiment uh, you can find this blog post he, you know, he, he wrote his thoughts about what we'd done uh, so you know this is this was this was a nice thing uh, and of course then you know then things started taking off you know I had nature on the phone and quanta and things like this um, but um, it, we, you know we're not finished yet we, we still have to prove we still have to prove the theorem uh, so what are we doing another way of thinking about what we're doing is we're digitizing mathematics right you might say that type turning mathematics into a latex document is digitizing it but um, we're, we're digitizing mathematics we're turning mathematics into into something which a computer can actually read and, and semantically understand. It can understand that we're, we're saying that this is a proof of this theorem and the proof goes like this. You know, the, com the computer can see its version of the proof and, uh, and, and read and understand it. So as, as I mentioned already, we digitized chess and go and you know, then all of a sudden there were great breakthroughs and uh, we've digitized music and, uh, and all of a sudden we have Spotify and my children you know, digest music in a completely different way to me. Uh, but we don't want to get carried away and say that we're going to be proving the Riemann hypothesis automatically. But let me finish by just listing two uh, potential uses of, of this digitization of mathematics, which are not science fiction. So the first one uh, is that when you write a paper as a mathematician, you have to decide what level of detail you're going to be giving. You know, it's the author that decides, you know, which proofs are going to be given and which proofs are going to be skipped. And as you can imagine, uh, if you start writing some kind of web-based uh, mathematical paper in this system or powered by one of these systems, then you can get some, you know, you can get some mathematical text where you can read in latex the description. And if you don't follow it, then you can zoom in. You can cl click on an argument and say, can I have more details? And all the details are there, stuff which has been skipped, you can, you know, you can unfold it and there it is. And eventually you can dig down and down and down. And if you like, you know, you can get down to the axioms of mathematics. So some English statement, which turns out to be slightly ambiguous, you know, you can actually look and see how it's been written in lean and see a completely formal ambiguity free statement. So I think that's something, you know, that within the next few years, uh, people are going to, uh, you know, we're going to start experimenting uh, with making you know, such texts. And uh, I think that's most definitely uh, within scope. So we, we have some preliminary version here. Our, our write up for the Schultzer work, uh, you can see we have, uh, you know, this is, this is written in LaTeX. Uh, yeah, but if you, you know, we say that the proof is obvious, that's exactly the kind of thing a human would say. But then of course you can, you know, you can, uh, you can see what this lemma is called in lean and you can jump to the lean you can jump to the lean proof and here's the obvious proof but unfortunately you know it's not interactive anymore it's uh and you know so in the future you know it, we won't be jumping to a static web page we'll be jumping to something like this and we'll be able to you know, interactively explore more so that's that's one thing uh, that, that i think we'll have in the future uh, so we're waiting on the computer scientists for this uh, and then another thing we can have is imagine i i could envisage a tool uh, which teaches algebraic geometry you know just just to choose a subject at random you know the stacks project is a gigantic repository on the internet of many 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 theorems in algebraic geometry all with their proofs and uh, i remember having to learn algebraic geometry and i found it extremely difficult you would look through the textbooks and if you couldn't find it there you'll kind of look through the research papers you know in in the paper you're reading it says you know x is true therefore y is true in other words, is it just generally true that X implies Y or does X imply Y in this particular situation? Because I know that I'm working over a smooth projective surface or you know, whatever. It's, if, if, you're, if you're not already an expert, it's difficult to read the literature. 
Uh, but of course, typing in 7,000 pages of algebraic geometry into a theorem prover will take an extremely long time. Uh, but there's a trick, right? Because a lot of those 7,000 pages are going to be proofs. Uh, so what if we just skip the proofs and type in the definitions? Just type in the definitions and type in the statements of the theorems and skip the proofs for now. We can come back to the proofs later. But now you could see that humans could really do this, right? Johan de Jong wrote the Sachs project. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote the vast majority of it anyway. If we have a team of people translating the statements and the definitions into Lee, then we end up with a gigantic database of facts in algebraic geometry. And computer scientists have tools which can look through databases and can start sticking proofs together and making new proofs and start looking you know, through databases of counterexamples and telling, well, this is true, well, this isn't true. You can imagine that this would become a useful tool for an algebraic geometry researcher. And again, this is something which I think is not science fiction. I think this is really possible. Uh, so those are just two ideas you know, that the community has had, and we'd always be interested to hear more ideas. Uh, and so that's it. So summary is that computer theorem provers can do what we're doing, you know, maybe more slowly, and maybe you have to learn them, maybe it's harder work, but they are a lot of fun, and I think their importance will only increase over time. We're digitizing mathematics, and as far as I'm concerned, that means we're making it better, we're making it more flexible, uh, we, you know, we're making it comprehensible to computers. Uh, and if other mathematicians come along and start to learn this stuff, and more importantly, start to teach this stuff like I'm doing, then uh, you know, more people, there will be more people to have ideas about where this thing is going. And uh, you know, the future will unravel in front of us. So that's it. There's the adverts. I wrote a game called The Natural Number Game. That's one way of getting into Lean. You can just Google for Natural Number Game. Uh, there's the community website. And finally, uh, I just finished last month teaching a course on this stuff and all my undergraduate course notes are up on the internet. And you know, as are various YouTube videos and things like that. So sorry for overrunning. Uh, I will stop speaking and thank you very much for listening. Let's thank uh, uh, Professor Basel for the wonderful talk. Oh. Thank you for, as I say, thank you for the opportunity. It's lovely to, to speak in Tata. Um, so we have some questions. Uh, so you can unmute uh, yourselves and ask the question. Uh, can uh, Mahesh, Kakar, can, can you go ahead and uh, ask the question? Hi, Kevin. This Hi, is Mahesh. Me. Hi. So I have two questions. It might... Uh, make me sound like a skeptic, but I am not. So one is, so one way in which uh, Borbaki and Math Library are very different is Borbaki was a very closed group, yeah. whereas Math Library is not. So uh, how, do, how do you make sure that like whatever is being written and incorporated into this is, is correct? Like, so it, uh, well, I mean, it, if it's formally mathematically valid that's what the computer is checking but are, are you asking about how do you know if it's sort of the sensible way to do things <laughs> no i mean you know if if some incorrect statement creeps in which is now being used to kind of verify other things but, like but, uh, but like what the, happened in usual way of doing mathematics right but the computer uh, will pick up the incorrect statement this is exactly what the computer is doing it won't say goals accomplished until it believes your proof and it only believes your proof when it's completely unraveled in it and has got some complicated, you know, internal directed acyclic graph, which humans never think about, which is a formal deduction of this theorem from the axioms of mathematics. Okay, so so you, you can't you can't put false statements in. You can't prove false statements. The only re the only way you can prove a false statement is if there's some hideous bug in the kernel. And you know, no bug has been uncovered yet. Okay. But even so if there is a bug in a kernel, you can you can recheck your proofs using you know, different type checkers. So, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, no. So, so you, so your statement that uh, sort of impossible to make a mistake is literally, you literally the, mean that. Th there's a huge amount of infrastructure. The computer scientists are super paranoid about this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the reason they're developing these things is they claim that our literature is is absolutely chock full of errors. And they are sort of really surprised that we're not concerned about this because we have sort of different grades of error. You know, if the theorem's correct, there's some intermediate lemma that's wrong, but big deal, the, you know, some modification is correct. You know, it's not a problem. 
Okay. This is our attitude, and they're kind of horrified by that because they want everything to be perfect. So they've developed tools where, you know, even if Lean's kernel does have a bug, mm. uh, they can run independent tools on the proofs. It's, it's like factoring, right? Factoring is hard, but once you've factored it, checking that the primes multiply together to give you a number is easy. So mm. Lean's kernel is doing the very hard job of turning those tactics into a into a complex complete proof from the axioms of mass but once you have that complex complete proof uh, you can then run it through much simpler programs that check that it really is a proof okay and so, my second question yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry uh, i don't want to take too much time but my second question is so you have spent now you know you and the group has spent x number of hours understanding the um, the the proof of uh, the fact that real numbers are liquid vector spaces or yep. whatever. I mean, so... Uh, so we've like, learned the material. It's kind of an interesting yeah, yeah. learning. So, 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 but now, I mean, independent of this lean, would, I mean, before your lean days, would you have been convinced by the time you have spent on it that you understood the proof? I mean, would you have... I would say yes. Yeah, if okay. I had put enough, if I had put as much time into just reading the paper the old-fashioned way, yeah, okay. into you know if i'd put as much time into that as i had into actually formalizing the various necessary lemmas then yeah. i would say i would yeah i would just be just so you, you would you know you would independently sort of you know as a human checker you would say yes i have checked the proof and it's yes true. i would but it wouldn't be true because <laughs> i really wouldn't have gone through if you look at the proof of theorem 9.4 yeah. and this you know analytic.pdf file on Schultz's website you, know, you don't want to read the details of that proof. And interestingly, I would say the first proof wasn't quite correct as well. Uh, uh, are we still being recorded? <laughs> I should be careful what I say. Uh, there, there was a part of the induction. There, there, at some point of the argument, there was an induction and the inductive step was fine, but the base case was slightly wrong. You know, at, at least the way it was written, uh, the, the base case wasn't quite true because not, not quite enough assumptions were there. Mm. And Schultz took one look and was just like, yeah, I can fix this. You know, and the next day he'd come back with a slightly modified version of the document uh, where the hypotheses, you know, was slightly different or in slightly different order. And then the base case was fine and the proof went through fine. So an another thing that we've achieved is that we've actually made the manuscript slightly better because mm -hmm. we've, we've removed some of the we've removed some of the slightly wrong lemmas slightly wrong but easily fixable lemmas and if you're learning this stuff a slightly wrong but easily fixable lemma can really derail you um, mm. because you might not know how to fix it but we had direct access to Schultzer because you know, he was an integral part he didn't mm. do any formalizing but he was always on hand to answer questions yeah. so we, we made the document better and and we've learned the material so mm. you know, that is something that wouldn't have happened if I just read it by hand read it the old way Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, Himansha, uh, you have a question. You can go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so uh, my question is regarding uh, like how do you compare Lean with other uh, theorem provers? Which, uh, like, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, Lean surely has uh, many, many more theorems than the uh, the ones in like uh, in uh, Cog correct, but uh, then uh, my question is regarding the uh, foundations of it, basically, uh, like uh, if uh, like at some point uh, we uh, like uh, maths community decides that to, uh, yeah the the current foundations are not that great, like maybe let's move to uh, to the uh, to different uh, foundations for maths, and uh, yeah, I mean uh, the, the you know like uh, the uh, ACTA. Uh, univalent uh, foundations thing is, yeah, is yeah, also yeah. Uh, uh, picking up so uh, how do you think like uh, th that's uh, that's gonna go for uh, lean and the uh, and the other project well there's there's lots of questions here you let me start by saying you you stated at the beginning that lean has many more theorems than cock and i find i think that's extremely unlikely to be true uh, because cock has existed for 30 odd years so cock probably has many more theorems than lean is my guess but what Lean has that Koch doesn't have is some centralized, rapidly growing repository containing all of undergraduate mathematics under classical logical axioms. And, and the, the reason that's important is because that's what we teach the undergraduates. Uh, that was the thing that was missing. But, but Lee, Koch, there are many, many projects 
many, many small projects that develop basic theories. That, 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 you know, there's, there's, uh, there's many, many theorems in Koch, but in Lean's maths library, we have many, many theorems all in one place. Uh, and that does change things because as a number, you know, number theory is quite a parasitic subject, you know, number theories existed for two and a half thousand years, but, you know, geometry comes along and we think, oh, maybe we could use geometry to do number theory or topology comes along. We think, oh, maybe we can use topology, you know, analysis comes along. Maybe we can use analysis to prove the prime number theorem. So it's kind of important that if you want to develop mathematics, you need everything all in one place. So it, it's not so much the number of theorems, but it's sort of the number of theorems that you could easily access uh, in, in a compatible way. So then you talked about, and, and let me also stress that I don't see any reason why they couldn't do just the same thing in Koch or in Agda, you know, another theorem preview you mentioned. I don't see any reason uh, why you couldn't develop a gigantic library of basic mathematical results all in one place in Agda. And I should say Egbert Riker, I think, is, is perhaps doing that. Uh, I think he would like to, to do that. But one thing I would observe about univalence is that if you start thinking about univalence, then you're suddenly thinking about equality in a very different way. You're basically saying that equality is the same thing as isomorphism. And whilst that might make some things in infinity category theory come out very nicely, uh, it makes doing basic, as far as I can see, it seems to make doing basic mathematics much more difficult because basic things we do with equality just somehow seem to be a whole lot more unwieldy. And so the people that work in the univalent theories tend not to be interested in the kind of undergraduate mathematics that I feel is so essential, uh, you know, as, as to uh, the core of a mathematical theorem proving system. And they tend to be working on extremely deep and interesting questions about, about higher equalities and uh, you know, getting equality to compute and, you know, recent developments in, you know, cubicle type theory and, 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 you know, and other different types of type theory. So people that work in the univalent theories, it, in my impression, it seems that they tend not to be interested in things like quadratic reciprocity or the continuous image of a compact topological space is compact. Because they, 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 they think that the concept of a topological space is a slightly funny thing, really. You know, they have various sort of approximations to it that classically will be the same, but constructively might be different. And they might instead want to think about locales and frames and these things that somehow we don't teach to the undergraduates. So I, yeah, I, I'm happily go on the record to say other theorem provers make a gigantic mathematics library because that's what's needed to build modern research mathematics. Uh, but as yet, it's sort of very hard to see other projects working in that way. So I do, do, do mathematicians need univalence? You know, I, as far as I'm concerned, the, you know, the case isn't there yet. We seem to be doing fine without it. Uh, but you know, if in the future we need univalence, then th this will become an issue. But I, as, as far as I can see, we're generating evidence that you can do a vast amount of modern you know, arithmetic geometry uh, and, and other things as well without any univalence axiom, without any change in the axioms that we've been using for centuries. So, you know, and, until the time comes where there's a compelling argument for univation, for, for univalence uh, in mathematics, I, I don't think I'm gonna worry about changes in the foundations. I'm very happy with the foundations we have. Uh, Abhishek, uh, you can go ahead with your question. Uh, hi, uh, so I wanted to know if, uh, you know, suppose I want to add a theorem to the math library. Great, be my uh, guest. <laughs> <laughs> so how would I know if that has already been added previously? Is there a way to know that? Uh, the easiest way for a beginner, let me just get out of this here. We have a, we have a chat. Uh, and there's the chat. Let me fire up the chat. Uh, and in the chat, one of the streams we have, one of the threads is, is there code for X? Uh, and, and here, people come along. If they're not sure of something, there are tools to look to see if something's in the library. 
but um you know here's you know here's uh you know here's somebody for example asking uh asking if it's true that you know if P, P, the number of times p divides the gcd of m and n is the min of the number of times p divides m and the number of times p divides n they're saying i can't find this in the maths library is it in the maths library you know and the conclusion of the community was you know it doesn't look like it is in the maths library so feel free to add it but sometimes people ask questions and there you see that so you know, here's somebody who says i want to i want the unique linear map from r to m r is a r is a ring m is an r module and given an element of the module, I want the unique linear map from the ring to the module sending one to that element. You know, I can't find it. And then somebody else instantly says, it's just here. It's there already. So humans can answer these questions for you if you can't get the computer to answer it. So yeah, ask, ask it's, it's very much a people driven thing. It's a, it's a huge community project. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah, and people are very, very happy to help. All right, thank you. Um, so, Gautam Harali, uh, you had a question, you can go ahead. Yes, hi again. Hi. Um, so this was, this is not a question specifically about Beam, uh, but um, this is about um, interactive theorem provers in general. So you made this statement about building on top of the existing Lean library. Mm -hmm. So are we, so it, in terms of formalization, are we talking about a strategy similar to abstraction in computer programming that uh, you are able to, in fact, have elements of the Lean library as strategies for what you uh, what you are able to write on top? Uh, and the second question is: so this is a little more specific about Lean, so. How many levels can one, in principle, uh, build in this way? Hmm. How many layers of abstraction uh, is possible? Theoretically, an arbitrary, arbitrarily large finite number of layers. So the answer to your first question is, yeah, this is, I mean, this is an example. You know, here's a project which isn't Lean's maths library. Uh, this is, you know, this is the Schultzer, uh, this is the Schultzer work. Uh, so we're not making, making the maths library is like Bourbaki, right? You figure out some new lemma, you don't write your new lemma in Bourbaki, you kind of, you, you know, you write your new lemma in your theorem, in your paper, and then you say, oh, this follows from whatever, theorem 3.2.9 of Bourbaki algebra. So similarly here, this, uh, th this work of Schultzer, we're not putting it into the maths library, uh, and in fact, it's not even clear that it should be in a maths library. I mean, maybe parts of it should be, uh, but yeah, we many of the proofs. You know, we use that. You know, we use a huge amount of the mathematics library, and we just build on top. And what and what's happening is that as time goes on, uh, we prove more theorems. But some of the theorems we think, well, actually, this lemma is appropriate for the mathematics library. And so then you start the process of making the pull request and get it in, getting it into the official mathematics library. So yeah, you can build on top of that, and yeah, other people could use this repository and build on top of it. It's we you, you're asking when does it start to break? That that's somehow your second question, and my answer is well, it didn't break yet, right. uh, and and what we're trying to do. One of the interesting things about the Schultzer project uh, is that we're trying to build in a very different direction to the direction that people were building before. Are they. If they, there's been some brilliant work in Koch. Uh, they proved the odd order theorem, you know, which is two, a 250 page book, basically, or two, two, you know, 250 pages in total. It's two books and a bunch of background as well. And this is an extremely hard theorem about extremely simple objects, namely finite groups. But we're trying to prove hard theorems about extremely complex objects. So we're building in a different direction. And right now, uh, we haven't seen problems. But yeah, you know, problems might occur, and then you know we might have to rethink our strategy. So, would it be a fair question to ask that uh, maybe there is some scope for sprucing up the structure of uh, Lean's math library? In that, you know, you talked about checking in terms of proceeding down a finite acyclic graph. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this is sort of facilitated by having um, tactics and proofs in, lean in the lean library be, be lower level tactics for a meta tactic and so on. Mm -hmm. But what you describe looks like um, writing certain stuff up from scratch. This is the analog of uh, simple lemmas building up to a complex theorem. So would it be fair to ask that there is also scope for sprucing up the structure of, of uh, proofs that call upon other proofs uh, within the lean library? Well, I don't understand what you mean by sprucing. I'm very happy with all the theorems in the maths library. Okay, uh, but I then, um, you know, when you talked about, suppose one was interested in checking, then you talked about a proceeding up and down a directed acyclic graph. Uh -huh. Presumably you, the direction a human checking this proof. Or or one could have an engine. Well, and, I mean the engine uh, is checking it all already, right? All of the mathematics library is checked, you know, it gets checked every time somebody makes a pull request, a computer checks that all the right. theorems are still correct. Okay. Uh, so, so you, you are in principle saying that even so, as soon as you make a pull request, um, as soon as it's accepted, <laughs> yeah, if it is accepted, uh, automatically um, uh, the the way later contributions uh, to the uh, to the lean library reside in there are as some layer of abstraction sitting atop uh, what's been written into Lean. Yeah, which uh, is also another layer of abstraction, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, so it, okay. you can see like, two, the, you know, the last change to the maths library happened two hours ago, uh, where you know, we, can, we can see what was added. So two lemmas were added, there you go. So two completely, th this says that uh, uh, if I've got two semi-linear maps between, <laughs> between semi-linear between modules over three different rings. I've got a map from M1 to M2 and a map from M2 to M3. And M1 is a module over R1, M2 is a module over R2, and there's a map from R1 to R2, and, you know, then, so, so they, there's two very simple lemmas about semi-linear maps, which happen not to be there, you know, prove that they're epimorphic in the category, if and only if they're surjective. Uh, and after that was put in, uh, that was just, everything was now compiled, yeah, th this is the incomprehensible proof that you can only read if you know if you know Lean's language. And then the entire thing was compiled. It probably took four hours to compile, and the compiled binaries were put up on the internet. And now, and uh, and now you can go ahead and check them. And it just so it's just been you know it's just been swallowed up by this gigantic growing mass of you know, this vastly complicated, incomprehensible to humans collection of. Uh, it proofs of everything completely right down from the axioms yeah. and it, it gets swallowed and and we build on top of it and that happens as i say you know, ah, ten, okay. 10 or more times a day yeah okay so now i understand i i just wanted to understand a little more the assertion about how it's it's impossible uh to be wrong um yeah the you I mean would, you would if i don't if want to say necessarily make... impossible but it's, yeah, uh, it's, but it's, yes. far, well, it's far more accurate yes. than a human can be yes right I, I so i wanted to know structurally how how that is so yeah okay that okay. answers that so every, right. every time something so right now there's 381 pull requests mm. and an extremely active team of 14 maintainers who, who put in a lot of hours uh dealing with these pull requests right uh, and you know not so by no means all of them get accepted but things go in one at a time, and uh, and each time it goes in, the entire thing is compiled again. You know, it's, it is an extraordinary. You know, all this is happening. Uh, I think we're paying good money to make this all happen. The storage and the compilation, but we have sort of multiple machines where all this is going on. Yeah. Thanks. Tiny implementation doubt. Um, how do you deal with the naming of the theorems? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, we have, I was extremely skeptical about this approach uh, when we started, uh, but I was told that there was a naming convention. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, the naming convention would tell you the name of the theorems. And as mathematicians, we're kind of lousy at naming, right? We, a great name, as far as I'm concerned, a great name for a technical lemma is lemma 13, right? Uh, <laughs> and they, they, they don't like those lemmas. So you can see the name of this. This will be in some, this will be called semi-linear map dot cancel right. Uh, and, and, and an algorithm has told us what this should be called. And this is called semi-linear map dot cancel left. So for basic, you know, for basic statements like this, um, you, can, you can come up with reasonable names. Uh, for more complicated statements, you, you try and state what the theorem is stating in the name, uh, in, in, in its name. And so for more complicated theorems, you can end up with names which are, you know, 50 characters long, uh, which is not ideal, but we're still really resisting uh, calling things, things like balls on it. Like the, but the binomial theorem is called ad pow. <laughs> it's called, or maybe nat.adpow or something. This is a sort of a great example. We won't call things, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the documentation, it says it's the binomial theorem. And if you search for the binomial theorem, you'll find it because you'll get directed there by the search. But, um, you know, the theorem is about you add two numbers and then you take the power. And so it's called add pow because that's the naming convention. So right. there is a naming convention. Right now it's doing very well at scaling because as you can imagine, I say we've proved 85,000 theorems, but the vast majority of those theorems are in some sense triviality. You know, 90% of those theorems are trivialities and then 10% of them have content. But, but yeah, we have, we have guidelines for how these things should be. You can't just make up your own name. There are guidelines and you have to follow the guidelines. I can show you the, I can show you the guidelines on the community website, but I, I, I read these guidelines and my first reaction was to be extremely skeptical uh, that this sort of thing would scale. You know, theorems about or will have the word or in, theorems about and will have the word and in, this sort of thing. You kind of think, great, you know, this is clearly not going to work beyond some point, but to my great surprise, it, it's still working right now. You know, this, is, this, is a, this is an element of a ring acting on an element of a module or an element of a group. Acting on a acting on an abelian group, so this is scalar multiplication. So it's called SMUL to be distinguished from MUL, which is you know internal multiplication in a ring or a group. So for example, the, the, the theorem that, that in a group G, G times one is equal to G, that will be called MUL one, and the theorem that one times G is equal to G will be called one MUL. You see, because those are two different theorems. Uh, but there you go. There's there's many many examples of how these things are. Yeah. So there you go, very long, Ooh. long description of how. Uh, Ellie, th this says, this, this theorem says X is less than or equal to Y if and only if X is less than Y or X equals Y. <laughs> you see, if you just see the name of the theorem, you can guess the statement. Once you know, once you know the naming conventions, a neg neg, you know, we'll say that minus minus X equals X. Right. <clears throat> Um, so, Karen, uh, there seems to be there seem to be more questions. Uh, I think we have already taken an hour of forty minutes of your time. Are you comfortable with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, or, uh, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. I should be at a committee meeting that started ten minutes ago, but this is a uh, wonderful excuse not to be there. I, is this still being recorded? It is still <laughs> being recorded, but I can cut it off. <laughs> I should be care I should be more careful what I say. I I'm more than happy to talk to people. Okay. Um, so, Arpit, you can go ahead with your question. So, my question was that uh, I, I just wish to understand a bit about how you implement how you implement the proof that checks inequalities of functions because these sound really complicated to me because the statement sometimes goes like there is an inequality between functions and that inequality holds up to a constant. That means uh -huh. there is a constant yeah, for yeah, which yeah. the inequality holds. So that yeah. seems very hard to prove on a computer. It's it's. I mean, one of the things we've noticed when formalizing that kind of stuff, I mean, things like big O notation, right? Yeah. You, you kind of say F is big O of G and things like this. Yeah. So we've, 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 had to form, we've had to formalize this stuff. We, uh, this was, there was prior work in Isabel done by Manuel Ebel. He formalized a lot of uh, sort of asymptotics of functions. And we, and we took his ideas and translated them into lean. And one of the things we learned is that actually humans are quite sloppy 
when they write this stuff, many, many, there's many omitted constants, right? You know, F, the, there's, you know, the, the, the implied constant can depend on certain things, but on the other hand, it must not depend on certain other things. And, and, and so one has to keep track of these things. I mean, do, do you believe that the theorems you're thinking of could, in theory, be translated down into the axioms of mathematics, right? You, 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 believe, that, you believe that this is true, and you're just kind of thinking, this is kind of going to be a bit of a mess. And so there are parts of the library that are a bit of a mess. But on the other hand, when you start working with things like asymptotics of functions, you start abstracting out general principles, like f is big O of g, and g is big O of h, therefore f is big O of h, you know, and this would be called big O trans or something. This would yeah, probably be a natural name for that or asymptotic dot trans, you know, we, we would come up with some naming version of this. And after a while you realize that what looks like a complicated argument can actually be broken down. I was quite surprised that mathematics worked like this. Sometimes I was just like, just follow your nose, apply some sensible logic and you're there. But actually what's going on is there are very general principles. You're just saying, well, you know, F is big O of G and A is big O of B, therefore F plus, you know, just or F times A is big O of G times B. There are, there are general principles. And you isolate these principles and you hide all the constants in them, you know, because the proofs have to use what the explicit constants are and what they depend on. But you hide behind these general principles. And then at the end of the day, the end user realizes that they can use big O notation. Uh, in, in the way that they would think about it in their, in their minds. This was quite surprising to me. That, so internally you have some kind of slightly messy lemmas, but as long as you prove the right clean lemmas, then, then the users of your, of your interface find it sort of natural to use in the way that they would write, you know, we, we like to make it so that users can write mathematics the way they write it naturally. And, and the way that's done is you make absolutely tons and tons and tons of completely trivial lemmas. If, for example, A plus C equals B plus C implies A equals B, that sort of thing, you know, that would be called add, write, cancel. So you give, you give the user access to all these lemmas and then you make them learn their way around the relevant part of the library. And then you find that they can just argue the way mathematicians argue. But yeah, under the hood, there is work going on. And sometimes it's very difficult to, to figure out exactly what the correct abstraction should be. And this is, this is part of the art of writing this code. And this is one of the things the maintainers do. You think you've had a good idea, you write down a definition, you prove some lemmas about it, you make a pull request to the maths library, and the maintainers say, do you know what? I think this would be more useful if it was more general, uh, or I think this would be more useful uh, if it was defined in a slightly different way. And then you have to start again. If it actually, you know, writing Borbach was difficult and writing the mathematics library is also difficult, but you collaborate with people and you find the right abstractions. And if you're lucky, things come out cleanly. Thank you. Are there other questions uh, from the audience? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Arpit has another follow-up question. No, no sorry. Yeah, that's okay. All right. So um, this has been a wonderful interaction. I think I learned a lot and- uh, Oh, great. <laughs> I hope uh, uh, that I will also uh, be able to get into this at some point. Watch it, it's addictive. It can derail <laughs> your research program. <laughs> certainly derailed mine, but on the other hand, I now have a new research program. <laughs> um, and uh, I hope uh, you find your files again soon. Oh, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to be there somewhere. All right. So.